Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all participating in the topic under discussion today. Before I proceed, I take pleasure in introducing our eminent panelists, Mr. Dinesh Joshi, CMD of Satyagiri Ventures, Mr. Anand Singhania, CEO of JK Enterprises, Mr. Rishi Kartaram, founder Jeff Commerce Group from Netherlands, Mr. Sanjeet Sethi, President, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, Mr. Hakan Bulguru, CEO of Arsenic, Turkey. Friends, as we get to the other side of the long and deep tunnel after being in economic hibernation, it's time to get back to the drawing board and look for opportunities that open up to a whole new world. We all know that every crisis has its own life cycle, and we are now at phase two of the economic cycle, where the velocity of change has been so swift we have seen two years of digital transformation in two months, according to Satya Nadella. This has compelled manufacturers, marketers, advertisers to alter their business models, their products, and mode of communication to address the new behavioral profile of the consumer, keeping in mind their changed psychographics and purchasing power. So as lockdowns lift, do I esteemed panelists feel that the current pickup in economic activity is sustainable? And are we then at the cusp of entering a virtuous economic cycle of recovery? Going forward, the topic assigned for deliberation in this session in the first half, it's been broken into two sections. The first section is an attempt to swat the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats pertinent to brand India, which are broadly well-known legacy issues compounded over 70 years due to inadequate planning, like not prioritizing family planning, having a high living density of 20,000 people per kilometer in urban India, and poor habitation in rural India. Thirdly, that 43% of our labor force remains dependent on agriculture, yet contributes only 16% to GDP. So does the solution lie in moving towards a universal basic income? Fourthly, our budgetary allocations have remained as low as 3%, 3.4% of the GDP in education and just 1% of national GDP in health outlays. And lastly, that the migrant crisis has brought to the fore the need for rural-urban rebalancing, making it even more important for labor exporting states to grow their own GSDP by incentivizing domestic industry. The COVID shock is expected to raise sovereign debt to GDP from 72% this year to 84% in 21. Experienced economists prescribe pursuing the path of exceeding the fiscal de deficit as increased borrowings will, will fund a faster rebound and consequently help service our debt better. How do our esteemed panelists react to these constraints? So may I open up this discussion and request Mr. Bulgurlu and Mr. Joshi to begin this dialogue before we move on to the next part on the accelerators of growth and India's deep frog into the digital age. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I Welcome. hope uh, my voice is clear. Very now, clear. First of all, I'm, I'm a firm believer in India's potential, uh, despite any circumstance, pandemic or not. We are honored. Uh, we have invested uh, in India with a joint venture with the Tata Group in 2007, uh, and we crowned that by opening a factory, large-scale factory, in uh, January of this year. Now, um, our belief in India is actually uh, coming from the accelerated growth in the middle class uh, that comes uh, directly, uh, basically, from uh, growth that's derived domestically, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, 
when uh, when I look at India, I see by 2030 an increase in uh, consumer spending by the middle class of roughly four trillion dollars, and there's no other market like that. Uh, so simply, uh, consumers starting to consume is going to drive the future of India. Now, being in emerging markets, uh, the pandemic has, of course, uh, affected things, uh, uh, but at the most, with India's case, delayed it slightly. Uh, you know, c- countries that can print their own money, uh, if you look at the US or Germany, which got caught at the top of the business cycle and were able to create uh, liquidity uh, that was never been seen in humanity before to mm. keep their economies uh, at least afloat. Um, sure. This is not possible in emerging markets. So we will see some reactionary problems. We will see some uh, current account deficits. The hard currency may become an issue. Debt servicing, as you mentioned, may become an issue. We will see increased trade barriers in these markets to protect uh, local producers and employment. But ultimately, I think India has a unique characteristic. And uh, this was clear to me in October. I visited the Darabi slum, Mm -hmm. uh, 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 an orphanage there. And there I saw people of all walks of life actually living very harmoniously with a smile in their eyes, Mm -hmm. uh, getting by with very little, but fundamentally being happy and cohabitating. The pandemic has made it very difficult, but there also you see them replay, you know, repairing a 110 year old Singer motor, for example. Nothing gets wasted. And when I look at India, I see consumers who are not willing to overspend on anything. I mean, uh, the name of the game in India is clearly value. You have to give the consumer more for less. It's the only way to win. And I think this frugal approach of the consumer, driven with uh, this drive towards the middle class and increasing consumption uh, power is going to create this unique model for India where made for India, made in India, innovated in India will drive in domestic growth. So uh, at most, these difficulties that COVID uh, is uh, causing is temporary and may delay this growth somewhat. But I still believe that the greatest growth potential in the world for the next 10 years comes from India. Interesting. Thank you, Dinesh ji. It's an excellent uh, summing up. It's very encouraging to hear that perspective from uh, from Turkey. Very encouraging. Um, so uh, what I see, uh, India has always been a land of opportunity. Hmm. And it's been there for centuries. You, know, you had British, you had the Dutch, they came, they they had uh, trading out there and they, made, they became rich and they went. Um, not getting back into the history, but... Uh, we are a very strong country. We have our strength is our population, no doubt. We are one of the largest democracies. Um, I feel that we are a land of entrepreneurship because we have seen that what has happened during the the, uh, the COVID times. Hmm. Just before the COVID struck us, we did not have. We were not manufacturing PPEs. We were not uh, ramping up our mass. Hmm. And now we are the second largest manufacturing of uh, manufacturers of PPEs in the world. So that's, that shows that, you know, Indian entrepreneurs do have, uh, you know, the fire in them. Yeah. We, have, we have come up with uh, excellent innovation in, uh, in the health sector. We have come in the, uh, you know, in the manufacturing sector. As far as the health sector is concerned, we are supplying at least 70% or, you know, of the world. I mean, 70% of the world is getting uh, ACQ from India. Hmm. We have we have come up with uh, you know we are also coming up with the vaccine. So I feel that you know India is going to uh, you know uh, recover much faster than the other parts of the world. Hmm. And um, I feel that India should increase uh, you know uh, give more impetus to manufacturing. They should improve uh, the ease of doing business. Invite more uh, uh, the international players. As our commerce minister said today. <clears throat> that uh, Atman Nirmar Bharat is not opening the doors for uh, you know the world. We are opening the doors to the world. Yeah, true. And, and that is what uh, you know they that should be conveyed very strongly to international investors and get India uh, large investment. We need big bucks. We don't need uh, loose change. Hmm. I'm sure that uh, we would be able to do that <clears throat> having countries like. Japan, US, and I feel even Australia, for that matter, would look at India and uh, you know uh, invest in India. So I, I see a lot of potential. I feel that uh, India would recover much faster, and uh, 
we should uh, you know get back to our growth on track in a couple of years couple of years you feel uh, mr joshi say about 22 23 months in months uh, what what does everyone feel 18 yeah, months year. this year is like a washout it, i think it's considered a, a, a washout i i feel a person like mr bulbul many industry groups have even said that to the pm and fm that why can't we consider 2020 as a zero year financially absolutely but but uh, let me also add the fact that mr hakan has uh, you know given the positive outlook of india that automatically shows that you know we will uh, come back soon we are sure sometimes you need that faith coming from that from an objective outside point of view and someone who's uh, dealing with india in such a big way as uh, mr bulgur do is doing i mean let me uh, let me step in there you mentioned my name twice just think of india as a place which can skip several steps i mean think of the traffic the infrastructure need uh the commercial office space that's needed and now consider that half of that's not going to be needed in the new future or the new normal i mean yes, yes, uh, yes. capital is going to be yeah capital is going to be directed where it's needed i mean the supply chain infrastructure is not in place yet in india but if you're going directly to an omni channel and online distribution or you're going direct to the consumer a lot of things are changing right telehealth uh, tel- you know education from distance so yeah. basically a lot of the infrastructure needed won't need to be funded anymore and that money can be used for uh, other infrastructure yeah that brick and mortar one we can be so right so i just I, want to add uh, one thing on uh, global value chains uh, supply chains yeah. i mean the the mncs of the world have uh, that, uh, anand yeah just coming okay. that uh, sure. where i wanted you i requ- request you to step in for that which sure. was as we discussed the last time the immediate challenges the immediate challenges and opportunities that lie ahead which will accelerate india's growth prospects as also our advent into the digital age were the exodus industries exiting china can you hear me hello yes okay sorry we all know this is a finite window of opportunity as 600 gbc than the process of due diligence so what are the lacking plug and play enablers which have thus far deterred india from be- becoming a front runner amongst asian peers more importantly viewing the inordinate duration of the pandemic are relocations even likely to fructify in 2021 as most mncs themselves could be in a state of decision paralysis due to uncertainty of demand and capital flow this is one question to you and one more anandji as countries are still navigating the early stages of transition to industry 40 is india geared to jump start to this uh, to this transition because the mckinsey report estimates that 400 to 800 million jobs will be globally displaced so do do you feel that the interim solution lies in incentivizing labor intensive industries and using this time to upskill because while india has the largest uh, talent pool we don't have a digital ready workforce which is scarce so uh, mr singhani i do request your insights into this because you have an in depth knowledge on this thank you bindu ji i would like to start by thanking uh, horaces and the organizers frank for giving us an opportunity to connect with uh, various uh, attendees from across the world and it's a very interesting format that we are all getting used to at this point of time sure so let me start with the first point which uh, mr hakan was talking about so i think the strengths that the mncs had was about global supply chains hmm. economies of scale and things like that i think this entire system of value uh, supply chain is going to be uh, is going to be relooked with a you know a fine tooth and nail with a magnifying glass given the fact that covid has happened i don't think this is going to lim- remain for very long this situation will change but people will again relook and see whether they can have like dinesh said about atmanirbhar have a local supply chain have a, a regional supply chain on one hand uh, 
talking about industry 4.0 uh, uh i think uh, you know we all know that uh, the first revolution was the mechanization the second revolution was about production the third one was on automation but this work from home and this pandemic has actually put uh, put uh, the fourth industrial revolution on you know on uh, on a roller coaster hmm. because now everybody needs to be uh, seeing the importance of being digitally connected people are looking at uh, you know uh, robots you talked about of course worldwide uh, numbers in terms of uh, labor statistics but i think even in terms of uh, technology i mean people are going to focus more on uh, robots there, you know there are only about uh, Three million industrial robots, which are operating worldwide, this has been growing at about fourteen, fifteen percent. People' uh, dependence on people uh, will probably reduce. On one hand, you've got new technologies which are already there uh, for some of us, whether whether they are AR, VR, um, artificial intelligence. Oh. I mean, take uh, additive manufacturing that has come in a big way. It's not only reducing time to market. Hmm. it's reducing costs to the market hmm. i mean i'm told um, is uh, i think it's boeing uh, the dreamliner hmm. on each boeing dreamliner because of uh, 3d printing they've managed to save 3 million dollars that's a huge amount that's of money amount. that's a huge amount so of course they have they have large uh, the each jet cost into multi million dollar values so 3 million is just a small percentage of that but it just shows the way technology is moving uh we talk about digital connects so i mean you know india is such a large i i share the optimism that both the speakers before me had the long term objective of india is very positive i think we have a large domestic consumption we have a, the median age is what about 27 uh we have very uh, you know it's the, the demographic dividend that india can give is phenomenal so uh you know just during covid i mean the one of the indian uh mobile companies has raised 15 billion dollars i mean that just shows that people around the world yes. are coming to india it. for yeah. content as mm-hmm. well as uh, you know quality uh, and connect so you know india is now at 1.1 uh, billion connections uh, which is phenomenal oh yes undoubtedly this was a, a hat trick i mean in these times to get that kind of inflow inbound uh, you know investment that reliance bank that was a really big win exactly you mentioned about china so let me just share a few thoughts on china i think supply chain uh, see today china is about uh, 4 trillion dollars which is mm-hmm. about 25 27% of manufacturing gdp worldwide which is about 15 trillion dollars mm-hmm. of course they are the second largest country by gdp but uh, if you look at that they have such a strong position in uh, solar power i think they are about 90% of solar power in smartphones they have 70% or the uh, you know capacity dinesh talked about pharmaceuticals they have 60 odd percent in pharmaceuticals market share this is not going to change overnight no this will okay. take time i think the indian government and various states have laid out the red carpet we have almost 400000 hectares of land which have been made available for investment but still uh, in ganya we've not managed to get what our targets were we are very well below our targets and that business is still going to vietnam of all places even uh, 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 taiwan or uh, uh, bangladesh why is it eluding india in the kind of uh we we would have loved to see it uh, come so i think uh, uh the this is not going to happen overnight i mean the pandemic has happened overnight no, we've been planning it the government of india entrepreneurs industry has been planning this at least since 18 months we're saying it's coming our way it's coming our way it is this is the do or die time as i said it's a finite window well some people feel that india has already lost the bus has missed the bus uh i think um, over uh, i think i think that there is you see people are relooking at their supply chain during covid mm. so they are going to revisit it yeah. i mean large investments take time people are trying to get their act together trying to manage the covid times 
Yeah. And then this investment will come if you look on a long term perspective. I think India has got all the all the right uh, all the boxes yes. are checked, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. May I add a bit on this? Please, please. I feel that we need to get to the crux of the matter. Uh, there is excessive bureaucracy, hmm. which needs to be curbed to a great extent. Yeah. If you want to get in uh, good international investors, we need to actually show them that there is ease of doing business. Yes, we have improved. uh to a great extent no doubt about it but we have to also face the reality that we are uh we are not that ease of uh, mr kataram you had some views on this and mr city about uh, our uh... yes yeah, so as as an uh, international investor as well in in yeah. india yeah. so we found that when we set up our company it, it was the ease of business even though it expanded and it's grown the last year is still very very complex so when you remit foreign funds and in this case we remitted maybe $100 more than was allowed you know it, it takes us so much paperwork and then also personal involvement by our auditors i think it costs like 5 to 600 dollars to get the money uh, back and to get uh, compliant in in, in mm. india so uh, and the strange things is it, it affects a lot of uh, things in india so uh, i think everybody is um, knows that the indian opportunity is huge you know uh, the, the population is huge but if you look at a dutch indian trade and i think holland and, and in general can can we, we can see us as an example because there's one thing which is holland is very famous for it's open it is a very open mentality and holland and dutch people go around the world and they start investing so holland is i think the third largest investor in india and it's also the third largest investor in the us but what's mm-hmm. the difference in in monetary value is that is 12 billion dollars invested by dutch companies in india and 800 billion in the USA. So mm-hmm. that shows you already the difference there. So even though India is looking for for money, only 200 companies from from Holland, you know, are investing in into India. So ease of business, you know, restricts that the difference. And why should there be like a 800 billion dollar gap between India and the USA? I think the, the opportunity in India is much larger than the USA uh, opportunity at this moment in time. So when that's changed, you know, when it eases up, you know, I think India can 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 lead instead lag behind. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you have something to uh, tell us? Or do you, what? How do you feel about this, Mr. Sethi? Well, you know, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, you know, it's a it's an honor to be here with my esteemed panelists and. Uh, yeah, well, and and you know, I think that probably one of the biggest things that uh, the people that are participating on this um, um, in this panel, as well as the the audience members, should really be thinking about um, is about the assumptions that we're making. Uh, I think over the past few months, in particular, uh, we've been able to we can start to identify certain assumptions that we had. pre-covid uh, that pretty much the pandemic has exploded uh, and i think that when you start to look at, at potential for innovation and growth uh, i think it's about really chiseling into uh, and starting to explore yeah. those assumptions whether it's the future of labor uh, which i think you've heard about uh, it's the future of the resiliency or where the breaking point is within supply chains um um or <clears throat> it's the future of when you start to think about um <clears throat> what healthcare has the potential to actually do or not do uh, i think the two fields that from my perspective um that i think uh india has an incredible potential to to be an innovator in um and, and the ones that i think are most changed um by this pandemic uh, are in healthcare uh, and higher education um uh, the only way you get to get better because you're you're an eminent uh, academic i i i don't know about eminent uh but i'm definitely an academia yeah. so but uh but i you know but for me i think it is about how do you move beyond uh directional innovation to a greater degree of intersectional innovation um uh you know i think um uh, many of our my esteemed panelists today have spent some time talking about um this idea of the long term uh and i think it's really important that we start to parse out not just long term but trying to think of long term uh in in really kind of three different orbits if you will um uh so uh, short term is now uh medium term is maybe uh from now to the next 15 months or so uh but then long term i think is 
kind of the the two to three year arc and then the the three year arc to ten year arc um, beyond. Uh, whenever time you're looking at long term, uh, you've got to be looking at a radical transformation of what higher education can offer um, and its mechanism of delivery. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, focusing a little more on the five aspects of digital India that we had earlier talked of, and I would uh, request all of us to expound on this. Uh, the pandemic has accelerated digitization by preponing its adaptation by at least three to five years, virtualizing offices, marketplace, and governance overnight. This has achieved 90% plus time within a short span. When globally teams are clocking 4.1 billion meeting minutes per day. Why I feel that this revolution will be the greatest social and opportunity equalizer more than previous revolutions is because it is accessible across geographies and social strata subject to just two, three premise, which is penetration of teledensity, availability of broadband access, and affordability of gadgets like televisions, smartphones, and tablets, which are the basic vehicles that will ride us into this revolution. And I just want to have one say before I open up to all that, as more than one zero prioritized delivery of social sector schemes like financial inclusion and ease of living in rural India, Modi 2.0 must prioritize working gadgets becoming more affordable. Because in doing so, it will achieve last mile connectivity that will accelerate adaptation to agri-tech, digital commerce, fintech, telehealth, and the edtech sectors. I have deliberately stuck to this and because these are the five major propellers of growth, which you could deem as champion sectors of the digital uh, uh, enhancing uh, the, the digital economy. And the other big sector which pertains to Mr. Bulgurdu is the uh, work from home, the new emerging work from home economy, which will drive domestic con consumption of direct to home services, gadgets and conveniences. And it would an idea of the Ericsson mobility. India's digital surge by 20%. And our data usage is currently 12 GB per user per month, much higher than the global average of 7 GB per user per month. These figures give an idea on the exponential growth of the digital sector and what is possible. So over to all of you who would like to start this, um, make it free, whatever comes spontaneously. Okay, I will yeah. start with uh, the, the digital revolution from uh, from uh, my speciality is the e-commerce side. So I think what we've seen in in the last uh, three to four months that e-commerce sales in, in general have, have you know doubled or tripled across all, all sectors. And and the nice thing about e-commerce sales is that um, it it opens up and it can help a lot of the different aspects you know in in India because e-commerce is about delivery, online shopping and delivery. So e-commerce can go hand in hand with supply chain optimization you know throughout India. So you can reach villages you know. So it can be a win-win situation. So it shouldn't be only like a corporate um, uh, you know effort. It, it can be a corporate and government effort to make sure that you can reach you know all the villages in in that sense. Uh, also the e-commerce opportunity and gives you know villagers and everybody in India the opportunity to sell on marketplaces you know everybody knows Alibaba and the Chinese are selling all around the world uh, and it always struck me that I see uh, you know it's not so many Indian entrepreneurs you know and using those e-commerce marketplaces and to sell around the world as well how much I think, think it's a huge uh, opportunity uh, one question just to all of you how much do you think that the e-commerce space will cannibalize or eat into uh, the uh, the brick and mortar uh, uh, retail space. 
So uh, I think everybody is afraid of that. But if you look at Europe, which is and and USA, which is quite far in in the, in, in the evolution, even in Europe, it, it's only at fifteen percent at the moment in time. Mm-hmm. It will grow, you know. It, it will go, and I, I think it will stabilize around to before uh, COVID, ten percent. Considering the amount yeah. of uh, yeah, so, phones people have, it's still at ten percent. Yeah, yeah, but the nice thing about India, ten percent is quite fast. Eh? If if you think about it, how long it took, uh, you know, developing countries to get at fifteen percent in Europe, you know, and India, you know, went went steps ahead because in India it's quite common now to get your food delivered in e-commerce. No, you see, and still in Europe, literacy is very low, Rishi. Here, yeah, you know, uh, so no, sorry, so what? Uh, yeah, so but adaptation goes goes quite quite fast and in that sense and i think uh, if you look um you know on that you also of course have then to make sure that you can communicate remotely you can work remotely which happens to zoom and and the formats which you're using now you know in, that will enable easy access to work and actually you know if you look at how much work we are outsourcing on on higher levels you know to india because it, it's, it's easier to connect with indian people as well and I think the third thing is what's very important is that the fintech space, you know, which is very, which is going to develop very fast in India, will enable access to, and to money and to get money flown out of all the different rural communities and back and and make our economy more thing. transparent, of course. Which is something yeah, and make it more transparent. Always wanted right. with demonetization, yeah. and it's just one of the perks that it just happened overnight, you know. Exactly, and the only thing is that I think India should should be maybe um, look for or be afraid of is that if you look if you look at the fintech space, you look at the e-commerce space, it's mostly foreign companies which are dominating, uh, you know, and that. And even if you look that digital content has become very prominent in India, uh, you have recently seen that Eros has been bought by foreign investors or has merged, you know. So you see a lot of um, in those companies you know going abroad so i think it's also up to india to decide how to keep some of those companies you know um, domestic and indian in that sense i have a few uh, things to add Mr. Kartan, if you don't mind a little bit differing in view maybe uh, because wh- where i look from the global appliance industry is about 213 billion with three percent annual growth india is about nine percent so india is already galloping ahead in terms of growth rate and uh, when you look at penetration numbers, PC penetration is only 6%. Uh, so uh, online and digital uh, omnichannel growth is limited by last mile internet and PC access only, which I believe will continue to drive brick and mortar sales in India. It will continue to be a big part of life, especially in rural communities. Uh, and you know, when you look at penetration numbers, only 29% of Indians have refrigerators, uh, 13% have washing machines. You know, these are very, very low numbers. So mm. growth will be huge in all sectors, essentially. Uh, it'll be agnostic, digital agnostic for a long Once time. Ref- but I, Once yeah, but I, I think you'll see digital grow fast. The second point I want to make, uh, earlier I may have misled, uh, I think global supply chains are changing, not just because of um, the way the world is developing. I mean, geopolitical risks are very obvious. People want their supply chains closer production footprints where the highest growth in local markets are. I don't believe you can sell products in India if you don't produce in India. If you don't produce, design, innovate for India, there's no way you can compete. So I wouldn't even bother incentivizing that side of the business too much. What needs incentivizing in India is R&D, intensive R&D, education, um, uh, which will build, uh, build the knowledge base of the country. The third point is COVID is a, is a pandemic, you know, it's a global shock. It, the onset was quite dramatic, but actually it's tiny when comparing to the coming climate crisis. And a country like India is much, much more vulnerable to that. And that's not far away. It's 10 years away, right? All the numbers we use are 2030, 2025. Well, you know, India is one of the uh, countries that will be uh, impacted the most severely from the coming climate crisis. So, I would focus a lot of energy and government funding towards mitigating that and preparing for that. Uh, In the appliance business, uh, we can do our best. For example, in India, we sold more dishwashers in the past month or two months than we did in the whole of last year, just because hygiene became an issue. But the side impact of that, when you wash dishes by hand, you use 120 liters of water. When you wash it with a machine, you only use 15. So that kind of, you know, information needs to get out there. The government needs to incentivize, you know, appliances that use less energy, uh, uh, 
you know, washing machines that use less water and really prepare the country towards the next crisis, which is a much bigger one. Uh, I just want to make those points because I think, you know, we lose focus just because of this pandemic. Uh, lose out on our ed tech sector. Mr. Sethi, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, because that uh, Ma'am, just one second before we switch topics, I just want to put one point across. Uh, you talked about Industry 4.0, and that talks a lot about the Internet of yeah. Things. And it talks about connectivity. Mm. So I just want to to just maybe tap Mr. Bulguru's uh, mind for a little bit. I'm, I read, uh, at least in the Indian context, about 5 million mobile phones went under repair. 150,000 uh, refrigerators went under repair. Maybe 75,000 televisions went under repair, which couldn't be repaired during COVID. You know, the all they did was DIY and, you know, some tele uh, checks. Do you see the trend going forward that, you know, and, and they say on the national, on the international level, there are about 25 million appliances need repair on a monthly basis. Do you see this evolving? I do, definitely. Uh, our appliances now are mostly connected, actually, outside of India. I mean, places where uh, the average selling price is slightly higher, uh, our appliances are connected. And the main driver of that is to provide preemptive uh, service. So we know when the appliance is about to have a problem and can preempt that. But uh, there are other issues uh, there too. Repair repairability of products is becoming a big issue. In Europe, the new Green Deal uh, basically mandates that you have to be able to repair the product uh, for 10 years uh, and longer in some cases. And also that most of the product can be recyclable uh, to, to contribute to the circular economy. I think that type of regulation is behind in India, uh, definitely, and needs to be accelerated, as well as uh, as well as higher energy, uh, you know, requirements from appliances, because this this goes towards the on a massive scale in India energy consumption. All of this can be made much easier with IoT and digital connectivity of the appliances, and I think that consumers will increasingly start demanding this as well. I know we're very short of time and we could go on for another hour or two even. But Mr. Sethi, education, we really are interested to know on your take on edtech. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I just think that there are so many significant opportunities to, um, to really revolutionize um, education in a moment like this. And I think uh, the conversation moving to saying, uh, let's look beyond COVID-19 and think about more about uh, what are the longer term challenges uh, that India is going to face, but also how India can really truly be a revolutionary le leader. Um, I think we've got to dispense with the notion um, that there's any sense of returning back in a kind of post COVID world. I think, uh, I think we've got to kind of cut the ties with this notion of quote unquote returning to normal. Uh, I think this is about how do you use this pandemic for the tremendous opportunities to start to think um, about a, uh, a a type of educational process, and I say that starts, uh, you know, I start that starts with the kind of secondary and pre-secondary education, all the way up through higher education, mm -hmm. uh, where you can start to really see uh, a culture that's built upon experimentation, a culture that's built upon um, a kind of that appreciates and understands failure, uh, a culture that really celebrates innovation. Uh, and I think that's going to make the difference in terms of the long term, being able to handle challenges like climate change, um, uh, other pandemics, um, as well as individuals that can start to feel like that they are more consistently. In India, we have a, a high dropout rate. And what I feel is that education is turning more an on-demand service like Netflix. Now, would you see this model persist? Of, uh, or will it turn more hybrid, uh, which is a bit of in-campus studies and, and uh, uh, work, you know, study from home? Well, in, in the same way that we've already seen uh, the future of work uh, be challenged and in some ways revolutionized by the past few months, I certainly see that within education. Um, uh, we start to, we can discard models to, to wonder what does it mean to have an undergraduate degree? What does it mean to get a bachelor's in science? Um, uh, it's very possible that those modes and, and the containers of education are really outmoded. Um, and so part of that's about the delivery. Um, how can you go ahead and have instruction that doesn't need to be in person and it can be online? Um, but more importantly, it's to understand 
uh, maybe it's the the mechanisms itself that we've kind of had the pedigree regarding higher education itself uh, really needs to be challenged. Uh, maybe it's not about a four year delivery um, uh, of an undergraduate degree. Uh, maybe it's about a two year delivery. Uh, and what does that start to look like? Okay, uh, Mr. Joshi, you had some very interesting points when we talked last on agri tech and. Uh, uh, Urbanization, you know, you see. What is the rural India and the green crisis setup? But what is the way forward for rural India in terms of the tech revolution? Dinesh, you're on mute. Although I'm not in the business of agriculture, but I feel that there is a potential, potential for agriculture, and we need to create more agripreneurs. Yeah. Right now, what the government, I, I mean, has been doing for years is you know just giving subsidy and you know helping out, but we need to actually create agripreneurs. What Alibaba has done by building up the Taobao platform, yeah. it has to be an integrated, uh, you know marketplace where you connect uh, uh, you know you fund the uh, you know the agripreneurs and you help them to develop their business through technology and strategic partnership and that would actually ramp up the uh, you know agriculture sector right now I mean, although we say that we are an agricultural country but uh, i mean the the the, the sector contributes to only 14 to 15 percent and that needs to be ramped up to at least about you know, 25 percent, and the only thing is what what is needed is someone to handhold uh, you know the yeah. farmers, create uh, you know entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, basically. That's right, absolutely, and and that is how we'll be able to give them an access to a larger market, mm -hmm. uh, because of which you know the the sector would develop and technology can be used in the best possible way. I feel that this could be possible since uh, <clears throat> Reliance and uh, you know Facebook have mm. teamed up. That could be an avenue for them to mm. explore. The mm. one is to look at you know helping the you know the uh, the agriculture mm. sector by connecting uh, you know the farmers and uh, you know the marketplace through a uh, tech platform. Um, and also, the second thing which I feel is the the same. Uh, uh, you know, the synergy can help the, uh, you know, small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. I think the agriculture sector needs to be ramped up through technology and through funding also. Alibaba pumped in about $1.6 billion. Mm -hmm. So we need some someone, you know, of that size to, you know, improve the agriculture sector by, by bringing mm -hmm. in the money. I don't just take, you know, agriculture sector as, you know, just giving us, you know, subsidy. Sure. I think that would that would increase uh, and make the sector much more mm. vibrant than this way. Binduji, may I add something mm. here? So there's a question in the chat box from one Mr. Mm. Gregory. His question is: uh, Everybody is speaking about India taking advantage of the digital virtual mm. world, but with 66 percent of the population living in the countryside, how will these two worlds uh, be put together? So I'd like to just address that by mentioning that, you know, with this, uh, with when we went through Demon, the government of India started a lot of these farmer banking accounts called the Jandan yeah. accounts. I must share that there are almost 330 yeah. million Jandan accounts giving banking connectivity to the rural people. Coupled with that, the government came up with a local credit card called the Rupe card, which is about 225 million people have got connectivity. And I spoke about the 1.1 billion people who have connection. Mm. So all of these people have, of course, not all of them have smartphones, but a large number of people are getting connected uh, with the rest of the India and across the world for goods and services. Well, you know, I know we're, we've just about got, got a few seconds left to say bye bye and thank you. So uh, I know we could continue this animated discussion uh, ad infinitum. Uh, which I hope we would keep up all of us uh, offline also. And uh, I would uh, sadly end it just now, much as I don't want to, but it's time up. And uh, we do live in a borderless world. 
So there is a commonality on this humanitarian and economic issues we are all facing, even though the pace of evolution would vary. I would love that we all keep up our dialogue on and off, uh, you know, even after this session. And really a pleasure uh, being with everyone. Thank you. God bless. And bye bye. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Excellent Love session. It. Thank, Thank you, Binduji, and Thank my you, fellow everybody. panelists. Thank you. Thank you.